So the factory farms is a large system that produces all the meat, almost all the meat in America today. Um, they produce and raise uh, hogs, chickens, uh, livestock in these massive uh, operations that are like warehouses of animals. Uh, sometimes you have 80,000, 100,000 birds in a single uh, confinement facility, uh, tens of thousands of hogs all basically you know, in prison. And uh, these factory farms that produce the vast majority of America's meat are uh, incredibly abusive to the animals, unhealthy for the animals. They produce uh, phenomenal amounts of waste uh, and pollution. So they've become a top polluter of America's uh, rivers and streams, uh, literally killing tens of millions of fish in uh, manure runoff. I shouldn't even call it manure, really. I mean, this is um, waste from these giant facilities. They have these massive lagoons that are literally the size of football fields filled with uh, hog waste, for instance. And, you know, there's evidence of ozone depletion uh, in regions like in North Carolina where they've got tons of these hog factory farms. And, uh, you know, so we're seeing like, you know, serious air pollution coming from these factory farms. Uh, there are studies showing that people who live near these facilities are getting sick, having respiratory disorders and asthma problems, um, throat problems. So it's like this is a serious public health issue as well as animal abuse issue. And this is the basis on which America's meat and chicken supply is being raised and, you know, raised horribly and then processed in, in their uh, killing lines um, thereafter. So they have these very short, uh, very sort of drug-boosted lives with lots of antibiotics and hormones. And uh, they often, the chickens especially and the hogs, um, basically don't get to move during their lifetime. You know, they just sit there in these pens, living often in, in their own excrem excrement. And, um, you know, there are stories of uh, truckloads of these hogs being shipped to the processing facility, and somehow the truck opened up, and the hogs would spill out onto the highway. And hogs are known as running beasts, and they didn't know what to do. They just stood there on the road, you know. Uh, so they, this is like the way they're being raised is entirely outside of um, their nature. Yeah, I mean, factory farms are uh, one of the top uh, polluters now of America's waterways. So they literally have, they've killed tens of millions of fish. They've also led to more than 35,000 uh, miles of America's riverways being polluted. Um, they are identified as a major source of a uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the size of New Jersey. Uh, it's phenomenal. And this is an area where you've got all these algae blooms and there's no uh, aquatic life uh, to speak of in that region of the Gulf of Mexico due to pesticide runoff and chemical fertilizers, but also increasingly from factory farm waste. So, I mean, what these facilities do is they spray all of their excess waste. Um, you know, first they dump so much of it into these huge uh, lagoons, and then they spray their excess waste onto uh, nearby farm fields. So they actually either buy up the land for that purpose or pay a local farmer to let them, you know, spray their fields with this hog waste, which is not normal manure. This is like highly condensed, highly toxic, you know, and it's filled with methane gases that are, you know, part of climate change. So, um, you know, and then they, and then it runs off into groundwater and rivers and streams. So it's a major source of pollution now in America. I mean, the production of meat. And uh, we've also seen that um, the meat industry has become one of the top sources of climate change. Factory farms are uh, the basis of that. You know, I mean, it, basically by condensing and consolidating meat production and all these animals into one space, all the waste they produce, the kind of feed that they're given that worsens the waste problem and, and the gases that come out of them uh, is now you know, combined as a major contributor to climate change.
No, it's, it's an amazing story. I mean, you know, we talk about the family farm. It's this nice American postcard image. And, uh, you know, politicians love to talk about this every five years or in any election cycle, um, saving the family farm, which is, and they don't do anything to do, actually do that. So we're losing tens of thousands of farms every year, mostly small farms or medium-sized farms. And literally one every half an hour in this country is going under. Um, you know, we lost 100,000 farms between like 2007 and 2012, just to give another example. So one of the main reasons for this is the consolidation in the farm sector. So as the large uh, food processors and supermarket corporations and fast food industries uh, can, you know, dominate the food industry, they dominate what gets grown and how it gets grown, they demand large-scale production and monocrop production from, you know, and they want large-scale producers to do this. Another big, so, th so that's one reason. And another big reason is because farmland costs continue to rise, uh, you know, as development encroaches on farm areas, um, there's more competition for, you know, rising those prices in farmlands. And, you know, you get also a situation where, uh, you know, the cost of machinery and the cost of uh, petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides, which are oil-based, uh, those prices go up. So all what we call the inputs, all the ingredients that go into farming, have increased dramatically. Meanwhile, um, the benefits for small farms, you know, the, the prices they can command in the marketplace to survive or thrive, have remained stagnant or worsened. Another key indicator is that uh, farmers' share of the overall food dollar has shriveled uh, dramatically in recent decades. So back in the 1950s, farmers were getting about 40 cents of every food dollar that we spent was going back to the farmer. Uh, it's a reasonable share. You've got supermarkets, you've got other people in the middle doing stuff, but you know, now it's a nickel. <laughs> Um, you know, and there's study after study of, you know, a box of cereal and the farm, you know, all the weed or corn or soy that went into that and then the farmer's getting a nickel or less uh, for that, for that uh, food dollar. So it's harder and harder for them to survive and the only way that they can survive is either uh, doing some fancy niche product if they're lucky enough to be in an area that, where they can actually get that to market or getting subsidies and supports, um, but only the large-scale farmers get um, most of the supports that we have from our tax dollars. So the subsidy system is another big reason. Um, you know, 70% of all of our subsidies going to large-scale agriculture for these giant farms that feed uh, the demands of, of corporate agribusiness, while the small, far small farms get almost nothing. Yeah, I would say we should reverse that situation. I mean, I think that there are so many reasons why um, the current system is a disaster for everybody, uh, including many farmers, by the way, who want to change uh, the way that they produce food. They'd like to diversify their production. They'd like to go organic. There are so many things that farmers would like to do, and they're in this trap, whether it's the, you know, we call it a pesticide trap, petrochemical trap, um, you know, or, you know, in terms of just producing what the giant uh, trading corporations like Cargill and ADM, what they demand, which is like soybeans or corn, um, you know, sold to a giant grain elevator, and there might only be one in the whole state. Uh, so there's no uh, negotiating power for farmers. You know, what I would like to see is us, you know, really reverse this situation where our tax dollars and our public investments are going to a food production system that sustains small farms, mid-sized farms. Uh, study after study has shown that small and mid-sized farms are the best for rural communities in terms of having a diversity of producers, uh, diversity of land ownership, and having more of these farmers that help sustain rural economies. So when you get to a situation where um, you're losing all these farmers one every half an hour, we see farm towns and rural areas across the country decimated uh, by the situation because there's no support for all, this, all the other surrounding businesses that farmers support in those communities. So, you know, and then it's bad for our health and bad for the environment and the future of our planet and for soil and everything else to have 
these massive monoculture systems where you've got 5,000, 10,000 acres, 2,000 acres of just all corn, all soy, maybe all wheat, you know, and, and no crop rotation, all petrochemical based, um, you know, destroying the soil. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that our tax dollars are being invested in right now, uh, really to the detriment and the harm of all of us, you know, farmers and consumers and the environment. Um, so it's really a shame because we're paying once with our tax dollars and then we're paying again for all the harm that that uh, creates. And we need to reverse that situation um, urgently. Yeah, so corporations have uh, come to dominate our entire food system. This has been trending since the 1950s, especially it started to ramp up in the 1960s. We saw as the post-war economy started to boom and, you know, we, we had more and more corporate mergers and business became corporate more and more. And then this took off again in the 80s and 90s and you had merger after merger after merger. And, you know, it's important to remember that these are generally approved by both Republican and Democratic administrations. So there's been really a bipartisan acquiescence or support for uh, big business to consolidate its power uh, in every sector of our economy, including food. And, you know, food is one of the basic essentials of human life. And there's been no attempt uh, by anybody in politics really to protect us from this. So we've gotten to a situation now where in every sector of our food system, uh, a few handful of corporations dominate all of, you know, they control the production system. So, you know, in beef, for instance, we've got just a few companies controlling, you know, 85% of the beef system. Uh, poultry is about 70%, you know, same in hogs. And then you go through all the major commodities and you find that you know it's 40 to 50 percent control by these few corporations, by like four corporations. And so again, these corporations demand uniform production, mass scale production of single crops, uh, or you know this source of you know factory farms that we were talking about earlier. We talked about like you know demanding that supply. They don't want small producers, you know, so they price them out. They knock them out of business. Um, these corporations control global supply chains. So supply chain is a whole system of production in which uh, the raw ingredients from one stage of production and processing to the next are you know, controlled by different businesses. And at the top, you've got a large corporation that is dictating the final result, whether it's, say, McDonald's or um, Coca-Cola, which uses tons of corn, or you know, name your fast food operation or supermarket, you know, so all these, you know, food processors and corporations at the top of the food system are saying, this is what we want, this is how we want it, and that drives everything in our food system in terms of um, how it's produced, who gets to produce it, um, you know, and, and, you know, again, this has all kinds of ramifications for our health and for the environment in terms of driving uh, these monocultures and driving um, fast production of meat, you know, which then, you know, induces, uh, you know, companies to use hormones and antibiotics and feed them grains that they're not, that are not healthy for them, that are not healthy for us to eat later. Um, so it's, it's basically a disaster <laughs> for all of us um, that a handful of these companies at the very top are, are driving this whole food system and trading system, you know, so they, you know, Cargill, for instance, um, has operations in more than 70 countries and they control so much of the, the trading and shipping of products. We have, you know, three corporations now controlling nearly half of the global seed supply. So it's at every single phase, I call it from seeds to supermarket, uh, where these companies dictate um, the conditions in which farmers are going to farm and eaters are going to eat. Well, it's an interesting, you know, the question about, um, you know, local production versus regional and national food production is an interesting one because I, I'm not a pure uh, nativist or isolationist in saying, well, every community should produce only its own food and 
we should all be hermetically sealed communities. Um, you know, I think that a certain aspect of, of trade um, commerce can can be beneficial. Um, you know, but I think that overall the tr the switch uh, from local to regional and national has been um, a bad thing for us in the sense that it's robbed local communities of the ability to feed themselves. It's turned local uh, farming communities into producers of raw ingredients, essentially, for our food system instead of whole foods. Uh, not talking about the supermarket, by the way, but actual with a lowercase whole foods. Um, you know, so we've gotten to the system through, you know, I chart this in my book, Diet for a Dead Planet, looking at the history of American agriculture turning into agribusiness and the industrial farming system, where not only the development of pesticides and heavy machinery, but also canals and railways and refrigerated cars and other things like that, has led us to a situation where we'd have regional specialization um, going away from local food production. So that meant that suddenly, uh, a region was looked at as the nation's producer of fruit or grains or cotton or, you know, you name it, whatever the product would be, or sugar or... And so in that situation, you had, some, you know, farmers getting less diverse in their, local, in their own food production. Um, the tradition was that farmers would farm, you know, a couple key crops for market and then produce also food for their own family or maybe even self to their local community. They'd have some animals on the farm. They may not even kill them all. They might be for eggs and milk. Um, and we've gone away from that diversification, which has been beneficial to soils and to farm economies and farmers' income. Uh, we've gone radically away from that to the point where uh, more and more farms have one crop or two crops. Uh, and maybe they have a small garden patch, you know, for a little bit of supplemental food for their family, but really not much. Um, you know, and another problem with this trend, which is not just in the U.S., it's global, is that regions around the world are basically pushed by um, these corporate demands, by trade demands, by capitalism, essentially, to become producers of export commodity products instead of producing foods for their community and for themselves. So you get a situation like NAFTA, which has uh, priced Mexican farmers out of corn. Corn being such a vital traditional staple crop in Mexican culture and Mexican rural economies. And so now you have a situation where farmers have gone under in Mexico. Tons of them have come up to the United States in economic desperation uh, lo and behold, to work in the meat packing and chicken factories, uh, the animals have been fed American corn that has helped put those farmers out of business. Um, you know, so we've been, in, you know, and lots of other countries have been forced into this export model where they no longer have staple food production for their communities. And then they're reliant on uh, pesticide contracts, trade contracts with generally these large corporations unless they can find a fair trade arrangement. Um, so nothing about this is helpful for farmers. I mean, you know, there are examples of farmers who do well at the large scale with, with uh, global trade or regional trade across country, but by and large, um, nothing about this is really helping farmers or uh, local environments, local food economies, um, or again, eaters. <laughs> um, so. Starting in the 1930s a little bit, and especially starting to take off in the 1940s, uh, we saw beginnings of pesticide use in American agriculture. Um, you know, a lot of these petrochemicals came out of um, weaponry and nerve gases from World War II, and um, I mean, yeah, so World War II, and you know, basically, um, these very toxic chemicals would create a system where uh, bugs would find, you know, bugs, most bugs would be killed off. You'd have the sort of super bugs um, in the Darwinian uh, scenario that would survive, and they would redevelop themselves as stronger bugs, stronger insects, more resistance to that current pesticide. 
And Rachel Carson, you know, with her book Silent Spring, really started to show us this in the early 1960s when pesticide use was really taking off, um, where, you know, spraying fields across America was killing birds, killing pollinators, killing insects. And you were having more and more of these cycles of resistance where, you know, these superbugs would arise, then they would develop a more toxic pesticide, and they'd keep cycling through this, where they would just use more pesticides. So they would keep developing stronger, more toxic pesticides and just dumping more and more of them on America's fields. You know, now we have 800 million pounds of pesticides dumped on our fields every year for our food production, 800 million pounds. So, you know, this is also not good for soil. We're using chemical fertilizers, um, heavy till agriculture, which is, you know, heavy duty machinery plowing the guts out of the earth. And so we're losing topsoil across America. Uh, we're now at a situation where um, the very rich topsoil across the Midwest, which is sort of considered the, the grain belt, the bread basket of America, is shrinking and dying. And in the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to lose just about all of the topsoil in the Midwest. When that soil, and, and tons of it's already dead, um, there's no real life in it. So we have to inject, quote, life, <laughs> temporary life uh, in the form of chemical nutrients and fertilizers into the soil to make it live and then use these toxic pesticides. So we're in this really deadly cycle when before the 1940s, uh, and 30s, we had, you know, centuries of organic agriculture uh, where we were not using really any chemicals at all. And, you know, we did, we did okay. You know, I mean, there were problems, but we did okay. And we need to go back to a system that is not reliant, dependent on ever more chemicals, ever more heavy tillage of the soil, ever more injection of chemical fertilizers, you know, again, these are also fossil fuel based, you know, so another problem with this, even as we're creating superbugs and then killing them off with more pesticides, is we're using 100 billion gallons of oil um, in our food supply. So this is entirely unsustainable. So we have a situation now in America where four corporations control roughly 85% of America's beef production. Um, you know, and this continues, they jockey for position and they keep buying each other out. And this is a trend that's been, you know, basically developing since the 1960s, ramping up in the 80s and 90s in particular, and in, in the 2000s. Um, we don't have much antitrust protection in America. We have some decent laws that could be much stronger. I would argue that we need to revisit antitrust law in America, that actually that's a significant uh, major factor in American food production and American agriculture that needs to be looked at, and uh, redefine what it means to be a monopoly or an oligopoly, as we call it, when you've just got a few controlling the entire um, economy or food sector. Um, you know, so this is happening for a variety of reasons. I mean, basically, we've allowed under, you know, Democrats and Republicans both have allowed merger after merger, these large corporations. And these corporations are doing it obviously for profit. They're also doing it for market control. And, uh, you know, we get to a situation across our food economy, whether it's in beef or other meat production or supermarkets where uh, corporations are, are amazingly doing this in a certain sense to survive. Uh, it's almost like we've had this mantra in American farming called get big, get out. Um, I mean, not you and I, but <laughs> the uh, agriculture secretaries and the farm bureaus and the deciders of, of farming have had this mantra of get big or get out. And it's really the same across the rest of our food economy. So beef production, chicken, hog production, you name it. You know, any sector, any piece of the American food pie you want to look at has a situation where you've got uh, four corporations controlling more than 40% of the market and up to 85% of the market in the case of beef. And mainstream economists have, have studied this over time and said that's a situation that becomes anti-competitive and monopolistic. Now the problem is, you know, we don't have adequate 
regulation and enforcement of antitrust to say, well, maybe the standard it should actually be higher, and you know, in terms of triggering antitrust law, but also, um, you know, you can have regional control of a, of, of a market. Uh, you know, can have four corporations having 85 percent, but one corporation might have 100 percent in a certain state or region. Um, you know, so this again has decimated uh, small livestock producers, small farmers, uh, pricing them out, buying up their you know corporations that I've you know investigated and researched, you know, buying up other farmers' land, knocking them out of production, uh, forcing them to you know produce the hogs or the beef for the large corporation, and have they have no other marketplace that they can go to. So they have no negotiating, you know, the smaller producers will have no negotiating power in that situation. And they have to sell to this large corporation. And there's just been no stopgap. In, in many respects, there's actually been a rollback of protections in the federal government. You know, now in the Trump administration, they're actually rolling back some of the efforts that have been made, some of the progress that's been made, slow as it is. Uh, to try to prevent this vertical control uh, in which hog processing and beef processors, for instance, control every aspect of live pro livestock production uh, from the growing or raising of livestock to the slaughtering of them. Um, so we really don't have the kinds of protections we need to be having. I mean, where else are they going to go? You know, there are niche markets. I mean, we are seeing, you know, some promise in um, you know, if we're going to have any meat production, uh, having it be organic and grass-fed uh, is at least better for us, better for the cow uh, or the hog in their case, not grass-fed, you know, in their own situation and, and free-range chickens. And, you know, there are problems with that. You know, there's, you know, problems in the sense that they're still often confined. They're not, um, there's too much of it. There's far too much meat production in America. If we're going to have any at all, it's far too much and far too consolidated. Um, but at least there are some situations where in the Midwest you're seeing small producers go into niche markets in grass-fed and, um, you know, so they're able to survive. You know, I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's the solution to the problem, uh, but, you know, by any margin, but it's at least something for the farmer. Every sector of our food system is somewhat different, has its own little set of market dynamics, but in just about every single category, we're seeing uh, four corporations controlling 40 to 50 to 60 percent of, you know, everything from, you know, we talked about the animal production, but also uh, grain production, seeds, which is the lifeblood of food. Uh, controlled by just Monsanto, Syngenta, and a couple other corporations at the top controlling you know, DuPont, Dow Chemical, uh, controlling this situation. So everything from flour milling to gra grain production, you know, again, we're seeing four or five corporations controlling 40 to 50 percent or 60 percent of the market. And so again, what this means is how many corporations uh, can farmers sell to? What are the options for farmers? And what are the demands on farmers? And what are the expectations? You know, it drives the supply chain that we talked about earlier, where essentially farmers have to play by their rules. Uh, another situation is in the chicken industry, where there's been this phenomenal consolidation uh, and control of the broiler chicken industry. Um, you know, where a few corporations control almost the entire industry. And we have classic cases of contract farmers, uh, these farmers across the South and Midwest who are uh, forced to grow chickens under contract for Purdue and for these other corporations. And all the terms are dictated by the corporation, the, the price that they're going to sell at, uh, the type of feed they're going to use, the antibiotics they're going to use. Uh, other drugs they're going to use to raise them, but all the risk falls on the farmer. So if they lose a, a big portion of the flock, which happens, you get various diseases, they can spread like wildfire, especially with consolidated uh, warehouses of animals like that. Um, those risks fall on the farmer. 
So we have an incredible situation where 70% of uh, these contract chicken growers in America are living under the poverty line or around the poverty line. So, um, you know, again, this is a disaster for the environment. It's a disaster for farmers and farm economies and, and not good for our health. Yeah, I mean, our farming system, which is, again, driven by these uh, large-scale corporate needs and the supermarket industry, you know, it's not just a few corporations. It's really uh, the whole food economy. I think it's important to think in terms of the food economy, which is controlled by these handful of corporations at the top. What does that demand? What kind of production does that demand? And this has been trending you know, for many years, since the 1940s, but it really even you can go back further in terms of demanding um, this kind of concept of fence row to fence row farming and, you know, not really thinking about the future of our topsoil, for instance, or other aspects of farm ecology, uh, and just all about production for this season, production for next season. Um, you know, and, and so as we get to that situation where you have, again, monoculture production, you, you do heavy till agriculture using massive machinery, plowing up the soil. Um, you're ruining all the nutrients, you know, life underneath the soil, churning it up, exposing it to, to the sun in ways that are not helpful because you've basically already killed the life underneath it. And then you're not adding any real new life to the soil. You're just giving it these chemical fertilizers. Um, and you're not rotating uh, crops, you're not having a diversity of nutrients go back into the soil. So this whole combination of, of what means, of, you know, ways that farmers are producing now is destroying our topsoil. We have maybe 20 or 30 years maximum left for topsoil across most of the Midwest. Um, a lot of it's already dead. So we're talking about what's left of it. And scientists, soil scientists, have looked at this and seen the rapidly uh, diminishing uh, depth of topsoil. So, you know, across Iowa and other parts of the country used to have, uh, you know, just such a rich, deep layer of topsoil, you know, that you could just keep going. You know, and now we've got just this thin upper crust of topsoil left where it's even alive. Um, so it matters tremendously for the future of our food production and it also means that we use more water when our topsoil is dead. And it also means that we're using more petrochemicals and we're reliant on that to, again, inject life into dead soil. And it's, it could take generations to replenish that soil. Uh, you know, soil and seeds don't get talked about as much as other elements of our food system often, but these are the most essential elements um, in, in food production. Yeah, I mean, we have a subsidy system um, that we uh, renew every five years called the Farm Bill, and the subsidy system is just one small part of that. A lot of it's transferred into crop insurance now, but basically there are a few mechanisms that are used to subsidize and support uh, agriculture and farming. And, you know, I'm in favor of public investments in agriculture, so it's not an issue of whether we should spend our tax dollars on food and farming, I, I think absolutely we should. It's the most, one of the most essential things that we could possibly spend our, our tax dollars on, our public investments on. Question is how and where do we do it? So if we're giving our subsidies to, um, you know, almost all of it to the, you know, the top 10% of large-scale farmers, and some non-farmers, by the way, who are paid not to grow, um, that seems like an absolutely uh, ridiculous approach that doesn't help us get to the kind of food system that we want to get to. I mean, there's a long history of how this developed out of emergency uh, crop payments and, and farm supports starting up in the 1930s under Roosevelt, FDR, that basically over time became a permanent system. And the commodity lobbies in the South and the Midwest, there's a lot of this very political. So these, base, these lobbies, these politicians in the South and parts of the Midwest started to control uh, farm policy. Um, we have food produced all across this country, and yet the, you know, the subsidy system is dominated by 
you know, just a handful of crops, basically, you know, corn, soy, wheat, cotton, sugar, you know, a little bit as well, and then oil seeds and a few others, um, you know, and all of these are raw ingredients. Um, so that's the other key piece that we need to think about is why do we have the subsidy system? We're now supporting a system with our tax dollars that is producing not only these monocultures and pesticide use and all of that and large-scale agriculture, but it's also producing uh, raw ingredients for processed foods, raw ingredients for livestock feed, and for fuel. Um, so this is the model that we have now. So there are a lot of impediments to changing it, a lot of heavy-duty interests at the top who, are, who would prevent this from changing because they want that uniform production. They want those raw ingredients. They rely on them. Coca-Cola relies on all that cheap, subsidized corn to produce the soda that, as we know, is contributing to so many pro health problems now among kids and, and others. And, and so, you know, we're paying again afterwards for, you know, all the uh, you know, consumption of whether it's soda and sh other forms of sugar or too much meat in our diets, and these are subsidies we pay basically twice. This issue of cheap food is a, a huge vital question that needs to be asked more and more, this myth, this myth that we have cheap food in America. So the problem is that We've created a system that relies on it, on this mythology of cheap food and this culture, this basically political economy of cheap food where the whole expectation in America now is that we're going to spend a small portion of our overall dollar on food when in Europe, for instance, they, they pay far more of their dollar for food. Now, I'm not one to argue that we need to pay more for food necessarily when there are so many poor people in America who are going hungry or almost going hungry or don't have you know, one in five Americans um, doesn't have a daily reliable source of food. And those who have it are often struggling to get by. Um, the problem is that so many of us are buying this food that is called cheap food, when in actuality there are a host of huge, immense costs that we're all paying that are, that are invisible. So when we have this diet um, that is based on all these heavily processed foods, all these like, you know, corn sweeteners and, and everything else, and then all the meat in our diets as well, we get a situation where we have, you know, almost half, roughly half a million people dying each year from heart disease. We're spending upwards of $100 billion a year, billion with a B, on diet-related diseases and illnesses. We're seeing a crisis of overweight and obesity in America, 65% of people overweight or obese in America, and of course that's a pre-indicator for potential heart disease or diabetes. Um, kids, you know, in the 1970s you might have had like 4% of kids overweight or obese. Now it's more than 15% of kids overweight or obese. These are all costs that we pay. We pay them in our daily lives and the way that we live, but we also pay them in the costs again to treat all of these uh, various forms of illnesses and um, that come out of the diets that we have in America from this cheap food system. The other key area that doesn't get talked about very much is labor. The workers behind our food system are intensely exploited. Our entire food system actually depends on intensely exploited labor. It's important for people to think about that, that all of the food we get would not cost what it costs, would not, you know, exist without this super exploited labor force. From farm workers, two thirds of whom live in poverty, to meat packing and chicken factory workers who I've interviewed and researched uh, are getting injured at phenomenal rates. Uh, carpal tunnel, you know, more than seven times the average worker rate. Uh, workers getting chewed up and spat out uh, like disposable people, basically, and many of them are chronically injured and unable to work either at all or very much for, for the rest of their lives, or they need health care in public health care facilities because they're not provided any health care. So these are all costs that we pay for the harm that is caused by this food system 
run by these handful of corporations. Same with environment, all the environmental pollution, all the cleanup. You know, sometimes there's a good lawsuit that forces the company to pay for the cleanup. That lawsuit can take years and cost billion, you know, millions of dollars to uh, pursue that lawsuit, you know, through multiple rounds in court. These are all coming out of our tax dollars. So we're paying once at the supermarket or in the, or in the restaurant. Then we're paying in our tax dollars th through the subsidy system. And then we're paying again for the unspoken hidden costs uh, from this supposedly cheap food system. Our beef supply, our chicken supply, if you look at our whole meat system, um, you know, we have what is thought of now as a very scientific system of food safety in America in terms of, um, you know, analyzing in the lab and protocols, and they have this system called HACCP, which yeah, food safety inspectors call have a cup of coffee and pray. <laughs> and it's really about hazard analysis, critical control points. But this whole system that has um, enabled the meat industry over time, through their lobbies, by the way, the meat industry, so including beef, chicken, pork, all these industries have lobbied government successfully under both Republican and Democrat administrations to radically increase the line speeds in these facilities to the point where in chicken, for instance, you've got um, it went from 90 birds a minute in the late 1990s up to 140 in some factories, 175 birds a minute today in these factories. In beef and pork, it's a little slower because the animal is bigger, um, but you're still talking about, about phenomenal rates and workers making tens of thousands of cuts um, on, on animal parts each day as these chunks of meat go flying by. And part of what's been going on with food safety inspection is removing food safety inspectors, government inspectors, from the line and putting them either into you know, analyzing lab results or basically looking over company records and reviewing the results and the notes of company uh, employees. So more and more companies are inspecting their own meat production. And they're lobbying the government right now, as we speak, to get even more of that happening. There's more self-inspection, more fox guarding the hen house in meat production. Um, you know, we also, you know, again in chicken, just to give another example, um, it, it's horrific. The conditions in these facilities are horrific for everybody. And we have case after case after case of meat piling up on the floor, meat covered with fecal matter, um, you know, and this stuff just gets reprocessed or put back into the assembly line, and it's up to the consumer to cook the crap out of it, as they say. <laughs> uh, and you know, this is even worse when you get to situations like ground beef, where um, you're talking about hundreds or thousands of animals being mixed together into a single burger patty, um, but none of it is safe. Um, you know, and they test the tiniest portion. They'll take a couple samples uh, from each shift to test for, uh, say, in chicken salmonella, or you know, they might test for listeria in certain cases. Although companies in beef are afraid to test for listeria because then they'd have to clean up their entire operation. Um, so they've resisted testing for listeria in beef uh, for years. Um, you know, when we had the mad cow crisis in America, um, we, you know, there was a constant push for um, you know, more testing, and it was still the tiniest sample of you know, America's beef production was actually being tested, whereas for pennies on the dollar, Japan was testing almost their entire beef supply. Um, so there's been this resistance by the meat industry and the poultry industry to have a real vigorous inspection of food safety. And this is, you know, this is our Consuming public, this is our health at you know at risk, and the results of this, you know, are we're seeing uh, tens of millions of Americans getting sick every year from the food they eat. So we have these huge outbreaks of Salmonella, Listeria, Campylobacter, and chicken, and um, you know, huge recalls, tons of waste, you know, that comes out of that uh, as well as food poisonings. So it's a terrible situation. 
with minimal and decreasing regulation and enforcement. Now, I was really pleased to be invited to be a part of the Real Truth About Health conference. Uh, we don't get that many opportunities to share uh, the research that we do, the investigations we do uh, with the public. Uh, there is a, a general sort of media blackout almost, or mostly blacked out, it's almost like an eclipse, um, where we're not hearing the vast majority of the truth about how our food is made, whether it's safe for us, uh, healthy for us, everybody else. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful and happy that we have conferences like this. I think it's vital that it be made free to the public. You know, I'm excited to see more of these conferences happen uh, here and elsewhere around the country. I've always been an advocate of seeing how we can get conferences like this into places where more people see them. Uh, whether it's online, of course, uh, where more and more stuff is happening, um, but also in person, you know, like poor areas that have no access to this information, um, may not even always have internet access. Um, so I think it's, it's excellent what's happening here and in some other parts of the country. There's not nearly enough of it. And they've done a great job at this conference of bringing in people. You know, I've learned a lot coming here myself uh, about other aspects of the food system that I didn't know about and um, you know, how plants operate and uh, other more scientific pieces of the puzzle. So, you know, it's great for all of us really to learn from each other. Um, when we did our panel, we learned a lot from each other, I think, you know, about different aspects of uh, the food production system and climate change and the environment. So, you know, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us, really, to learn from each other and to teach people, and just share the information and share the, you know, the analysis. Um, sometimes you get to share, you know, little sound bites uh, here and there, but to get the time to really talk through the issues and to uh, explain why, you know, why we're in the mess that we're in with food, I think is critical. Otherwise, we're not going to really fix it. Thank you.